namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa so we're continuing on with the next section of the mahaparinibbana sutta tikinakaya 16 this is the sutta of the last days of the buddha and uh, we came with the last reading, we came to the point where the Buddha has, this is the, now we're now into the last, the Buddha's very last evening and night, and he came to um, settle for his uh, Parinibbana at uh, Kusanara. The Lord said, Ananda, let us cross the Hiranawati River and go to the Mala Sala Grove in the vicinity of Kusaranara. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, and the Lord, with a large company of monks, crossed the river and went to the Sal Grove. There the Lord said, Ananda, prepare me a bed between these twin sal trees with my head to the north. I am tired and want to lay down. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, and did so. Then the Lord lay down on his right side in the lion posture, placing one foot on the other, mindful and clearly aware. This is the position you'll see in statues of the, the Buddha in the lying position. Uh, and this is the position that he uh, assumed to enter uh, Parinibbana, lying on the right side with his hand under his head and his uh, upper leg slightly bent. This is the uh, called the lion's posture. There's one. Um, I think it's in the Anguttara Nikaya. There's one uh, mention of different postures for sleeping, and it said that a Buddha sleeps always on the right side. A sensual person sleeps on the left side. Sleeping on the back is uh, raises um, ghost consciousness and sleeping on the belly animal consciousness and those twin sal trees burst forth into an abundance of untimely blossoms which fell upon the tathagata's body sprinkling it and covering it in homage that is untimely blossoms meaning it out of season the the trees burst forth miraculously into into flower divine coral tree flowers fell from the sky as the parichataka tree in tawatinksa heaven the flowers from that uh, fell and blanketed um, the locality divine sandalwood powder fell from the sky sprinkling and covering the tathagata's body in homage Divine music and song sounded from the sky in homage to the Tathagata. And the Lord said, Ananda, these sal trees have burst forth into an abundance of untimely blossoms. Divine music and song sound from the sky in homage to the Tathagata. Never before has the Tathagata been so honored, revered, esteemed, worshipped, and adored. And yet, Ananda, whatever monk, nun, male or female lay follower dwells practicing the Dhamma properly and perfectly fulfills the Dhamma way, he or she honors the Tathagata, reveres and esteems him and pays him the supreme homage. Therefore, Ananda, we shall dwell practicing the Dhamma properly and perfectly fulfill the Dhamma way. This must be your watchword. And just then the venerable Upawana was standing in front of the Lord, fanning him. And the Lord told him to move, move aside, monk, do not stand in front of me. And the venerable Ananda thought, this venerable Upawana has for long been the Lord's attendant, keeping close at hand at his beck and call. And now in his last hour, the Lord tells him to stand aside and not stand in front of him. Why ever does he do that? And he asked the Lord about this. Ananda, the devas from ten world spheres have gathered to see the Tathagata. 
for a distance of twelve yojanas around the Malasal Grove near Kusanara. There is not a space you could touch with the point of a hair that is not filled with mighty dewas. And they are grumbling. We have come a long way to see the Tathagata. It is rare for a, tagata, for a Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha, to arise in the world, and tonight in the last watch the Tathagata will attain final Nibbana. And this mighty monk is standing in front of the Lord, preventing us from getting a last glimpse of the Tathagata. But Lord, what kind of dewas can the Lord perceive? Ananda, there are sky dewas whose minds are earthbound. They are weeping and tearing their hair, raising their hands, throwing themselves down, twisting and turning, crying. All too soon the blessed Lord is passing away. All too soon the welfare is passing away. All too soon the eye of the world is disappearing. And there are earth dewas whose minds are earthbound who do likewise. But those dewas who are free from craving endure patiently, saying, All compounded things are impermanent. What is the use of this? So some dewas have uh, realized the Dhamma. And in another place, the Buddha says, in every dewa world, there are some uh, sotapanna, some stream winners. So the most of the dewas are still attached to sensual existence and they're weeping and crying but the ones who have realized the Dhamma they just nod their heads and say so it is all things are impermanent Lord formerly monks who had spent the rains in various places used to come to see the Tathagata and we used to welcome them so that such well-trained monks might see you and pay their respects but with the Lord's passing we shall no longer have a chance to do this Ananda, there are four places, the sight of which should arouse emotion in the faithful. That is, uh, in the Pali, arouse emotion is some emotion is samwega. Uh, samwega is one of those words that's very hard to translate. It means something like a religious awe, like being moved spiritually. What are the four places? Here the Tathagata was born is the first that is Lumbini. Here the Tathagata attained supreme enlightenment, that's the second, Bogaya. Here the Tathagata set in motion the wheel of Dhamma, is the third, that's the deer park at uh, Sawati. And here the, the Tathagata attained the Nibbana element without remainder, is the fourth, that's where he is now, Kusanara. So these are still considered the four places of pilgrimage in India, and they're all recognized locations, the place where he was born, the place where he was enlightened, the place where he taught his first sermon, and the place where he entered Parinibbana. And people still, to this day, make um, pilgrimage to those places. And Ananda, the faithful monks and nuns, male and female lay followers, will visit these places. And any who die while making the pilgrimage to these shrines with a devout heart will, at the breaking up of the body after death, be reborn in a heavenly world. Then Ananda asks, Lord, how should we act towards women? Do not see them, Ananda. But if we see them, how should we behave, Lord? Do not speak to them, Ananda. But if they speak to us, Lord, how should we behave? Practice mindfulness, Ananda. You have to uh, understand that Ananda was, you know, uh, although he's very devout and well behaved, he was a, a sensualist. He, he did have the uh, attachment to the to the world of the senses. So this um, admonishment of the Buddha to be careful around women. But Lord, what are we to do with the Tathagata's remains? No, I'm sorry, I missed a paragraph. Oh Lord, what should we do with the Tathagata's remains? Do not worry yourself about the funeral arrangements, Ananda. Drive for the highest goal. Devote yourself to the highest goal and dwell with your minds tirelessly, zealously devoted to the highest goal. 
There are wise Katiyas, Brahmins and householders who are devoted to the Tathagata. They will take care of the funeral. In other words, the, the, lay, the lay community will take care of the, the funeral. Don't, don't bother yourself with it. But Ananda still wants to uh, press the point. But Lord, what are we to do with the Tathagata's remains? Ananda, they should be dealt with like the remains of a wheel-turning monarch. And how is that, Lord? A wheel-turning monarch is uh, the uh, very rare legendary world-ruling emperors that arise in a great length of time. They're, they're like the uh, worldly equivalent of a Buddha. Both a Buddha and a wheel-turning monarch are Mahaparisa, great men. And someone who's a great man, a Mahaparisa, has 32 marks. As the, when the Bodhisatta was born, the, the wise men recognized the marks on him and said he will either be a wheel-turning monarch or a, a Buddha. And that, um, that tension between these two fates uh, determined a lot of the early biography of the Buddha. So... Uh, Wheel-turning monarch is the um, secular equivalent of a, of, of a Buddha. Ananda, they should be dealt with like the remains of a wheel-turning monarch. How is that, Lord? Ananda, the remains of a wheel-turning monarch are wrapped in new linen cloth. This they wrap in teased cotton wool and then in a, in a new cloth. Having done this 500 times each, they enclose the body, the king's body, in an oil vat of iron, which is covered with another iron pot. Then, having made a funeral pyre of all manner of perfumes, they cremate the king's body and raise a stupa at a crossroads. That ananda is what they do with the remains of a wheel-turning monarch, and they should deal with the Tathagata's body in the same way. A stupa should be erected at the crossroads for the Tathagata. And whoever lays wreaths or puts sweet perfumes and colors there with a devout heart will reap benefit and happiness for a long time. Ananda, there are these four persons worthy of a stupa. Who are they? A Tathagata, Arahant, fully enlightened Buddha, is one. A Pacheka Buddha is one. A disciple of the Tathagata is one. And a wheel-turning monarch is one. And why is each of these worthy of a stupa? Because, Ananda, at the thought, this is the stupa of a Tathagata, of a Pacheka Buddha, of a disciple of the Tathagata, of a wheel-turning monarch. People's hearts are made peaceful, and then at the breaking up of the body after death, they go to a good destiny and re-arise in the heavenly worlds. That is a reason. And those are the four who are worthy of a stupa. So uh, there are two kinds of Buddhas. There are fully enlightened Buddhas, Samasam Buddhas, here called the uh, Tagata, and uh, there are Pacheka Buddhas. And the Pacheka Buddhas are silent Buddhas or solitary Buddhas. They uh, arise in the ages between fully enlightened Buddhas, and they have the same degree of understanding and penetration of reality and of nibbana but they don't establish a teaching and their their uh, enlightenment doesn't lead to any anything significant in the world they don't establish a, a sasana tradition like a fully enlightened buddha does and the venerable ananda went into his lodging and stood lamenting leaning on the doorpost alas i am still a learner with much to do and the Tathagata is passing away who is so compassionate to me. A learner is a seka. That means that the Nanda at that time was a stream winner, a sotapanna, the first stage of enlightenment, the first of four stages. And someone who is um, uh, in the first three stages, they're called a seka, a learner, because they still have something to learn. And... An arahant, the fully enlightened one, one who's reached the fourth stage, is called asika, a non-learner. Because he's gone beyond, he doesn't have anything further to learn. 
So Ananda is now standing weeping in his lodging. Then the Lord inquired of the monks where Ananda was, and they told him. So he said to a certain monk, Go, monk, and say to Ananda for me, Friend Ananda, the teacher summons you. Very good, Lord, said the monk, and did so. Very good, friend, Ananda replied to that monk, and he went to the Lord, saluted him, and sat down to one side. Then the Lord said, Enough, Ananda, do not weep and wail. Have I not already told you that all things that are pleasant and delightful are changeable, subject to separation and becoming other? So how could it be, Ananda, since whatever is born, become, compounded, is subject to decay? How could it be that it should not pass away? For a long time, Ananda, you have been in the Tathagata's presence, showing loving kindness in act of body, speech, and mind, beneficially, blessedly, wholeheartedly, and unstintingly. You have achieved much merit, Ananda. Make the effort, and in a short time you will be free of the corruptions. Ananda had been the Buddha's principal attendant for the last 20 years. And um, after the Buddha's decease, in, at the time of the first council, they wanted to have um, 500 arahants to meet and uh, determine the, the teachings of the Buddha, to you know, agree on what would be the, the, uh, the canon of teachings. And uh, Ananda at that time was not yet an arahant, so this created a problem because he was the one who had the most knowledge of the Buddha's teachings. So he made a supreme effort of meditation and became an arahant before the, uh, the council began. And the Buddha is uh, kind of predicting that there. He says, make the effort in a short time you will be free of the corruptions. That is the destruction of the asawas. That's another name for arahantship. Then the Lord addressed the monks. Monks, all those who were arahant, fully enlightened Buddhas in the past, have had just such a chief attendant as Ananda. And so too will those blessed lords who have come in the future. Monks, Ananda is wise. He knows when it is the right time for monks to come to see the Tathagata, when it is the right time for nuns, for male lay followers, for female lay followers, for kings, for royal ministers, for leaders of other schools, and for their pupils. Ananda has four remarkable and wonderful qualities. What are they? If a company of monks comes to see Ananda, they are pleased at the sight of him. And when Ananda talks Dhamma to them, they are pleased. And when he is silent, they are disappointed. And so it is with nuns, with male and female lay followers. And these four qualities apply to a wheel-turning monarch. If he is visited by a company of kachyas, of brahmas, of householders, or ascetics, they are pleased at the sight of him. And when he talks to them, and when he is silent, they are disappointed. And so too it is with Ananda. After this, the Venerable Ananda said, Lord, may the blessed Lord not pass away in this miserable little town of Wattle and Daub, right in the jungle in the back of beyond. Lord, there are other great cities such as Champa, Rajagaha, Sawati, Saketa, Kosambi, or Waranasi. In those places there are wealthy katyas, brahmins, and householders who are devoted to the Tathagata, and they will provide for the Tathagata's funeral in a proper style. So that's a um, quite a poetic phrase, this miserable little town of Wattle and Daub, right in the jungle in the back of beyond. Unfortunately, I, I found that um, that literary flourish is entirely Maurice Walsh's, the translators. If you go to the original Pali, it's much more prosaic. It just says this this uh, barren little town, barren and remote little town. We find this with Maurice Walsh's translation that he's um, has the the penchant for literary flourishes. You know, he's actually very, uh, very readable prose, but some, he takes a bit of liberties with the original text. But the point here is, is the same, that um, Ananda is telling the Buddha he shouldn't die in this miserable little town. There's a similar 
thing happened when Ajin Mun was dying, that um, some of his he died in some remote place in northern Thailand, and some of his disciples said, uh, "Sir, you should uh, go to one of the big cities because then there will be many people who will be, make merit by um, attending to you in your last hours." And Ajin Mun said, "No, if I die in a big city, they'll they'll have after I die they'll." They'll have a great big festival and feast, and many animals will be slaughtered to feed the people. Better I just die in this remote place when there's just a few people around. Here, uh, the Buddha's reply is, Ananda, don't call it a miserable little town of Wattle and Daub, right in the jungle in the back of beyond. Once upon a time, Ananda, King Mahasudasana was a wheel-turning monarch, a rightful and righteous king who had conquered the land in four directions and ensured the security of his realm and who possessed the seven treasures. And Ananda, this King Mahasudasana, had this very Kusanara under the name of Kusawati as his capital. And it was twelve yojanas long from east to west and seven yojanas wide from north to south. Kusawati was rich, prosperous and well populated, crowded with people and well stocked with food just as the Dewa city of Alakamanda is rich, prosperous, and well-populated, crowded with yakas and well-stocked with food, so was the royal city of Kusawati. And the city of Kusawati was never free of ten sounds by day or night, the sound of elephants, horses, carriages, kettle drums and side drums, lutes, singing, cymbals, and gongs, with cries of eat, drink, and be merry as the tenth. So this is an interesting parallel to a paragraph from earlier in the same sutta where the Buddha and uh, Ananda were in Patalagami and the Buddha said, in future times, this place will be called, it's now it's just a small little town, but in the future it will be called Pataliputta and it will be a huge city, the capital of all India. So in that section, he's seeing a small town will in the future be a great important capital. And in this section, he says a little town used to be in the past, a huge flourishing capital city. This is an illustration of the impermanence and the changeableness of samsara, how things, things change. What's a, a little town now used to be the great capital of an empire. And now Ananda... Go to Kusanara and announce to the Malas of Kusanara. Malas is the name of a tribe. Tonight, Wasetas in the last watch. Wasetas is referring, it's another name for the Malas. Tonight, Wasetas in the last watch. The Tagata will attain final Nibbana. Approach him, Wasetas. Approach him, lest later you should regret it, saying that the Tagata passed away in our very parish and we did not take the opportunity to see him for the last time. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. Taking robe and bowl, he went with a companion to Kusanara. And then the Malis of Kusanara were assembled in their meeting hall on some business, and Ananda came to them and delivered the Lord's words. And when they heard Ananda's words, the Malas with their sons, daughters-in-laws, and wives were struck with anguish and sorrow. Their minds were overcome with grief, so that they were all weeping and tearing their hair. Then they all went to the Sal Grove where the venerable Ananda was. And Ananda thought, if I allow the Malas of Kusanara to salute the Lord individually, the night will have passed before they have all paid homage. I had better let them pay homage family by family saying, Lord, the malice so-and-so with his children, his wife, his servants and friends pays homage at the Lord's feet. And so he presented him in that way and thus allowed all the malas of Kusanara to pay homage to the Lord in the first watch of the night. And at that time, a wanderer called Subada was in Kusanara and he heard that the ascetic Gotama was to attain final Nabbana in the final watch that very night. He thought, I have heard from venerable wanderers, advanced in years, teachers of teachers, that a Tathagata, a fully enlightened Buddha, only rarely arises in the world. And tonight, in the last watch, the ascetic Gotama will attain final Nibbana. 
Now a doubt has arisen in my mind, and I feel sure that the ascetic Gotama can teach me a doctrine to dispel that doubt. So Subhada went to the Malas cell grove, to where the Venerable Ananda was, and told him what he had thought. Reverend Ananda, may I be permitted to see the ascetic Gotama? But Ananda replied, Enough, friend Subhada, do not disturb the Tathagata, the Lord is weary. And Subhada made his request a second and a third time, but still Ananda refused it. But the Lord overheard this conversation between Ananda and Subhada, and he called to Ananda, Enough, Ananda, do not hinder Subhada, let him see the Tathagata. For whatever Subhada asks me, he will ask in quest of enlightenment, and not to annoy me. And what I say in reply to his questions, he will quickly understand. Then Ananda said, Go in, friend Subhada, the Lord gives you leave. Then Subhada approached the Lord, exchanged courtesies with him, and sat down to one side, saying, Venerable Gotama, all of these ascetics and Brahmins who have orders and followings, who are teachers, well known and famous as founders of schools, and popularly regarded as saints, like Purana Kasapa, Makali Gosala, Ajita Kasankambali, Pakuda Kachayana, Sanjaya Betalaputta, and the Naganta Nataputta. Have they all realized the truth as they all make out, or have none of them realized it, or have some realized it and some not? These are the, the names that he listed off there are, occur many times in the canon. They were the teachers or leaders of different philosophies and religions in, in India, contemporary with the Buddha, and are often called the six, uh, in English, they, they call them the six heretic teachers. They, were the, they used to say the rivals of the Buddha. Enough, Sabada, never mind whether all or none or some of them have realized the truth. I will teach you the Dhamma, Subhada. Listen, pay close attention, and I will speak. Yes, Lord, said Subhada. And the Lord said, In whatever Dhamma and discipline the Noble Eightfold Path is not found, no ascetic is found of the first, the second, the third, or the fourth grade. That's the, you know, the four grades of enlightenment. But such ascetics can be found in the first, second, third, and fourth grade in a Dhamma and discipline where the Noble Eightfold Path is found. Now, Subhada, in this Dhamma and Discipline, the Noble Eightfold Path is found, and in it are to be found ascetics of the first, second, third, and fourth grade. These other schools are devoid of true ascetics, but if in this one the monks were to live their life to perfection, the world would not lack for arahants. So this is a, a teaching that's often cited as to... In, an answer to the question, does anybody get enlightened outside of the Buddha's dispensation? And the the answer the Buddha gives is that if they have the Eightfold Path, which includes, of course, the right view, you know, right view and uh, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi. And if in this one the monks were to live the life to perfection, the world would not lack for arahants. So this is this is another statement that's often cited that it, as long as there are monks in the world that are, are following Dhammavinaya, then there will be arahants in the world. This is um, something that's in in modern times. It's been you know in in the recent let's say re, you know last hundred two hundred years. There's been some Buddhist thinkers or sort of the, the uh, teachers that say there's no more arahants in the world. It's not possible to become an arahant. Um, this has been contested, of course, and in Thailand, in the forest tradition, they, they believe that many of their teachers like Ajahn Man, Ajahn Cha, Ajahn Mahabua have become arahants. Then there's a, a stanza of verse in the English translation, as, as we cited last time. The English translation doesn't attempt to imitate the meter of the Pali verse, 
Pali verse is marked by a very regular meter, and there are several different meters that are used. Uh, rhyming is not really a thing with Pali verse, but uh, alliteration sometimes is. Twenty-nine years of age I was when I went forth to seek the good. Now over fifty years have passed since the day that I went forth to roam the realm of wisdom's law outside of which no ascetic is, first, second, third, or fourth degree. Other schools of such are bare, but if here monks live perfectly, the world won't lack for arahants. At this the wanderer Subhada said, Excellent Lord, excellent. It is if someone were to set up what has been knocked down, or to point out the way to one who has got lost, or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place, so that those with eyes could see what there was. Just so, the blessed Lord has expounded the Dhamma in various ways, and I, Lord, go for refuge to the blessed Lord, the Dhamma and the Sangha. May I receive the going forth in the Lord's presence. May I receive ordination. So the going forth and ordination is English for uh, Papaja and Upasampada. That is the the lower and higher ordinations. The Papaja is going forth and become a novice and Upasampada, the acceptance, one becomes a bhikkhu. Subhada, whoever coming from another school seeks the going forth and ordination in this Dhamma and discipline must wait four months on probation. And at the end of four months, those monks who are established in mind may let him go forth and give him ordination to the status of a monk. However, there can be a distinction of persons. Lord, if those coming from other schools must wait four months on probation, I will wait four years, and then let them give me the going forth and the ordination. But the Lord said to Ananda, Let Subhada go forth. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And Subhada said to the venerable Ananda, Friend Ananda, it is a great gain for you all. It is very profitable for you that you have obtained the consecration of discipleship in the teacher's presence. Then Subhada received the going forth in the Lord's presence and the ordination. And from the moment of his ordination, the venerable Subhada, alone, secluded, unwearying, zealous, and resolute, in a short time attained to that for which young men of good family go forth from the household life into homelessness, that unexalled culmination of the holy life, having realized it here and now by his own insight and dwelt therein. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What has to be done has been done and there is no further here. And the venerable Sananda became another of the Arahants. He was the last personal disciple of the Lord. So that concludes this this section with the um, going forth of Subhada and his attainment of Arahantship later. So we have one more section to go, which we'll do next week. And this is the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta. <laughs>